very impressive mathematical papers when I was a student in the early 1960s. In January 1965, he invited me to give a talk at Caltech's Jet Propulsion Lab. For the next year and a half, I flew down there from Berkeley one day every week. I was one of the consultants he recruited to their Space Communications Division. Three of the other members of that group later started a small company, which eventually grew into the $100 billion behemoth now known as Qualcomm. In addition to our common interests in telecommunications engineering, Saul and I shared interests in mathematical puzzles. Many of Saul's favorite problems involved elementary number theory. Others involved possible and impossible arrangements of the 12 pentominoes. Here are some of the ways to pack them into a rectangle. The state of California then required all new startup corporations to have at least three directors. Saul invited me to join him and his wife, Bo, in forming a venture called Recreation Technology, also known as Rec Tech Inc. Saul's business plan was to sue Parker Brothers for stealing Saul's game of polyominoes. But this never materialized. Without any serious investment, nor sales, nor any employees, after a few years, Rec Tech gracefully went out of business. But it became the dry run for another company called Cyclotomics, whose initial directors were Saul Galam and me and my wife, Jenny. As that company grew to 40 employees, Saul became my business mentor. For more than 20 years, we averaged several phone calls per week. He was professor of mathematics and electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Southern California, and I had the same pair of titles at Cal Berkeley. We were active allies in the Information Theory Society and in the National Academies. To kick off their initial sales of Rubik's Cube, the ideal toy company held a highly hyped Hollywood media event featuring two characters, the famous Hungarian-American actress Zsa, Zsa Gabor and the famous mathematician Solomon W. Gawam. My father was a Christian minister, and Saul's father was a rabbi. But despite that, Jenny invited Saul to be our son's godfather. The church service included a pledge to raise our son in the Episcopal Christian tradition if Jenny and I died before our son reached the age of 18. Saul gladly accepted. His knowledge of New Testament scripture exceeded ours. Saul was fluent in many languages. He served as an expert witness in a high-stakes European patent dispute between Qualcomm and a Swedish company named Ericsson. In the course of that trial, Ericsson produced an untranslated Swedish document at the end of one afternoon. To everyone's amazement, Saul spent most of the night studying it, and the next morning his testimony about it proved decisive. Saul and I both served as expert witnesses in a different patent dispute between Mitsubishi and Ampex. The judge had issued a paradoxical ruling that the relevant patent applied to bytes, but not to bits. The lawyer's efforts to explain that the relevant device had both bytes and bits were strained. Saul broke through those foggy communications with an analogy from the movies. Not only does color necessarily include black and white as a special case, but in some movies, some portions of the movies are black and white, whereas others use color to make an important point. In The Wizard of Oz, scenes in Kansas are black and white, but everything is colored in the land of Oz. Another movie example is Schindler's List. At various epochs, Saul's mathematical puzzles and problems columns appeared regularly in the Johns Hopkins Alumni Magazine, in the Information Theory Newsletter, and in the Los Angeles Times. When a change in publishers at the LA Times discontinued Saul's column, Saul noticed that they also discontinued the entire science section. But they lengthened their astrology column and circulation went up. Here is a picture of Saul and his wife, Bo, with me a few years ago. Saul and I attended all of the first 11 gatherings. 
two years ago, a few days before the G4, G12 gathering, Saul called me to say that he would have to miss that event because his wife, Bo, was hospitalized and he needed to visit her every day. That was my last conversation with Saul. I later learned that a few days later, the doctors told him that his wife was unconscious with no real chance of recovery. That so depressed him that he himself died two days later. Bo died less than two weeks later without ever regaining consciousness. At one of Saul's birthday parties, guests were given these Galam pins. <laughs>